Thanks so much, and thanks for the for the invitation to be here. It's really a pleasure to get a chance to talk to you all. And um, bear with me; I am um, working my I I, I work uh, in classrooms all day long with a mask on, and I'm used to it. So I'm going to continue to do that because I'm trying to protect everyone that I'm working with. Um, but I'm glad to be able to be here. So as best noted. I do Chicago history. Yeah, I'm, I'll I'll talk as loud as I can. You got it. Let me know if it's let me know if it's loud enough. Um, so, I got interested in early Chicago history because of the Encyclopedia Project. So, I that's how where I got my particular interest early on. And so, the book, The Rising Up from Indian Country, is about Chicago, around, in and around the War of eighteen twelve. Um, and so, that book. I used uh, a source called Waubon, Chicago in the, the Northwest in the old, early day. And it was written by this woman, by Juliet Kinsey. And so when I finished the book on 1812, I, I wanted to go in and take a look at, at Juliet and her life. And Waubon, so Waubon, if you haven't looked at it, oh, is something that I would encourage you to, to pick up. Um, it's online. It's never been out of print. It was first published in 1856. And it's, it, it makes her the very first historian of Chicago. And I think she's a really interesting character in that way. She's also, it's also, it's history, it's also travelogue. So she's also describing the world that she's living in when she moves west. So she's born in 1806 in Connecticut, Juliet Kinsey is. And she moves west in 1830 when she marries her husband, John Kinsey, who's the son of uh, the John Kinsey, who's of the infamous John Kinsey from the Fort Dearborn era. All right, this son is, by 1830, the, the sub-agent for Indian Affairs to the Ho-Chunk, to the Winnebago, in, um, up in Portage. And... The story of how they come together is for another day. But Juliet decides that she wants to move west. And so she's uh, 24 years old, and she marries uh, John Kinsey. So she's not a, a young woman in, 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 uh, of her generation in terms of when she got married. She moves west to Portage. And so what I want to start with is thinking about her. Juliet Kinsey is born an Easterner. And she moves west, and she chooses to be a Westerner. So she really defines herself as a Westerner for her entire lifetime. But the story I want to talk about today is when she gets redefined by, by mostly by her, uh, her daughter's family. Her daughter will move to Savannah, Georgia, and she is going to be described as a Northerner. And this is someone who never really thought about herself as a Northerner. As an Easterner, yes choosing to be a Westerner, and then uh, being defined as a Northerner by uh, the people around her. So that's the story that I want to talk a little bit about here today. Let's see if I can get this. Okay. Let's see. Good job. Go back. Okay. I don't know why it's not working. It did it to me last month. But you're good now. Oh, oh yeah, we can go to the next one. Yeah. Sure. So this is, oh, great. This is, okay, I'll keep my finger on that one. Um, this might be a familiar image to you just from her story of Chicago in the 1830s and 1840s. This is the her drawing of the Kinsey House, which the Kinsey House is the Jean-Baptiste Pointe du Sable House. Um, 
built on the north branch or on the, the north side of the main stem of the Chicago River. But again, it gives you a sense of, of her skill. She's a writer, she's an artist, she's going to draw maps. She's a really interesting person in that way. What I found in investigating Wa Bun and her life is that she was also an amazing letter writer. And she wrote thousands and thousands and thousands of letters over the course of her lifetime. The bulk of the letters that have been preserved are preserved between her daughter, Nellie, and herself, largely in the years just before the Civil War, during the Civil War, and after the Civil War. So what I'm going to talk to you about today, a lot of that comes from the letters that she's written to her daughter, and they come back and forth. The book is for the earlier era. So I was able to extend her story because of all of these wonderful letters. OK, just a couple of slides on Portage, because she starts there. That's where she comes in 1830, comes out when Chicago is a part of Indian country. And one of the things that she does do when she's out here is she gets to know many of the, particularly the officers in the US Army who are posted in the West. And they included amongst them Jefferson Davis. So Jefferson Davis was someone that she got to know. Uh, he was infamous in her family and the telling in, in their family because he made very big, heavy, bulky furniture in the, uh, the fort up at, at Fort Winnebago. And um, they inherited it. So um, Jefferson Davis was kind of a, a code for badly made furniture for their family for many years. But um, again, she got to know her brother-in-law, her future brother-in-law is a man by the name of David Hunter, who's going to become a major general in the Civil War. He's in the US Army. He's going to be in and out of the Army for a, a, a period of time. He's out in Kansas in the 1850s. But he goes, he's going to go east with Abraham Lincoln, because not, he's one of the crew of people that goes east when, when Lincoln does and is on um, something of a protection detail, although David Hunter is another character that we, whether or not that's in the end what's going on. At any rate, they build, she and her husband build a house. So if you haven't been up in Portage, Wisconsin, it's a wonderful spot that the colonial dames have maintained as a site. They build this house in 1831, 1832, so just as the Black Hawk War is beginning. So she experiences war during those, that time, that Black Hawk War. Her first child is going to be born just at the end of the Black Hawk War. So this is an Easterner moving west, and she brings things that she's going to try and recreate out in Indian country, her world. The piano. This is the same model piano that she, that, uh, she brought with her. The legs were off over the, over the portage uh, and up the Fox River. She brought and this is her china that's up there at Portage. In 1833, after the Treaty of Chicago that ends uh, this region is Indian country, she and her husband moved to Chicago because they, can claim, they claimed a lot of land. The Kinsey family did on the near north side. The Kinsey addition to the original subdivision of Chicago on the near north side. Michigan and Cass is Illinois, excuse me, is um, Hubbard and Wabash today. So this is where she builds her house and the, the, um, the um, subdivision is up here. So right, right across from Fort Dearborn is where her husband's family had built, had initially purchased their, the holdings from G. Baptiste Point du Sabo. So this is Julia Kinsey different guys than the one that's on the cover of the book and that we usually think about with Julia Kinsey. It was done in 1838 by an itinerant uh, uh, portrait painter from Peoria, and it's her daughter Nellie. So these are the two figures that, whose letters going back and forth tell us the story of Chicago during the Civil War era. And this is the house they build. It's um, Roughly at the side, it's at, well, as I said, it's at Wabash and, and uh, Hubbard today. If <laughs> you look down three, three, three stories, right? Because it's uh, with Wacker Drive and the Hubbard, the two level Hubbard. So it's, there's nothing there now. But this is a brick home in a, uh, in a frame town. They're very wealthy and they make their money on what? They make their money on real estate. They're going to lose all of, much of their money 
after 1837-38 with the panic that comes then. But in the meantime, Juliet's an institution builder. She and her husband helped to build St. James Episcopal Church, one of the first religious institutions in town, and it's directly across the street from their house because they give the land for the house for the church, and she can look out her windows out at this church. Her house is in the distance here. She and her husband build the lake house, and this is Fort Dearborn here in the foreground. In one of the very first uh, images of Chicago, uh, ph photographic images of Chicago, this was done by Alexander Hessler. I don't know, there, maybe some of you are familiar with this image if you are, uh, you like Chicago history. Uh, Paul Lane, who does uh, restoration of photography, I, I just, when I, he got these people to pop out. At some point, hopefully in the not too distant future, I can sit down and try and figure out who some of them are. Uh, but this is 1857 in Chicago. No, it's 1856 in Chicago because it's just before Fort Dearborn is going to come down. And this is what Chicago looks like. Again, it's another one of Hessler's images right in that same area. So Chicago's going to grow from just a couple of hundred people in 1830 to... Um, there are 30,000 people in 1850 to 100,000 people in 1860. So she's living in Chicago as it's growing rapidly. And this is a wonderful palmatory map. Her house is right here, right along the main stem of the river. The first railroad line is here, the Galena in Chicago. These are the grain elevators, the lake house. And right here are the yards for the Cyrus McCormick plant. So the story that's going to unfold here, she's living in the middle of what's become a, a really one of the big industrial areas of Chicago. It's on the near north side. The railroads are on both sides of her. And she lives in um, a neighborhood that's got, lot, that's got industry, the elevators, as well as then some of these older homes at her home is on uh, multiple lots. They have a, she and her husband had a big garden and outbuildings uh, for many years. That's just a close up of that house. By 1856, she and her husband then had been established. They had four children that they were raising to adulthood. She has her portrait taken. This is the portrait on the cover of my book, but it's also the portrait that sits not in Chicago, but in Savannah, Georgia, which is the story of how this story turns Southern um, as we move into this. She, her, she, Julia Kinsey, this painting is done by G.P.A. Healy. Um, you guys, uh, the folks with studying the Civil War era, G.P.A. Healy is kind of our, you know, he's our standard bearer for portraits, right? Abraham Lincoln, my, one of my favorite images of William Tecumseh Sherman, U.S. Grant are done by G.P.A. Healy here out of Chicago, at Lincoln, I mean, I, I, to, to start there. She has, by this point, doesn't have a ton of money, but she pays for, she and her husband pay for portraits of, them, of each other. By this point, so this is painted in 1856-57, John Kinsey is one of the organizers of the Republican Party in Illinois. So he's organizing the Republican Party. He's been a Whig, and as a Whig politician, he'd been They've been, he'd long been supporters of William Henry Harrison going back to the 1840 election. And in the 1840 election, they met another Whig from further down, from downstate by the name of Abraham Lincoln. And so their stories, again, politically, the Lincolns and the Kinseys are, um, are, are involved in organizing them, the, this new political party in Chicago, in uh, Chicago and across the country, in Illinois and across the country, the Republican Party. So this is John H. Kinsey. Um, these portraits are in Savannah. So they are here because just before the Chicago fire, Juliet's daughter Pat has them packed up and sent down to her. The house that I showed at the beginning is going to burn in the 1871 Chicago fire, but a couple of things get saved, and there are things that got that wound up going down to, to Nellie. This is Nellie, and she's the woman then that uh, the letters, most of these letters are back and forth with. And Nellie's portrait is an enormous one. Um, and uh, she, Nellie, by 1855, 1856, 
has gone to a finishing school in New York for a few years. She met in New York a Yale student by the name of William Gordon, and they courted back in New York. And um, when she comes back to Chicago and he goes back to Savannah, Georgia, where he's involved in cotton in a cotton brokerage firm, his father has died, and he's working under an uncle and several guardians, but uh, and trying to build up this business. Nellie and he have an understanding that they're going to get married, but they have a lot of trouble. Um, because the 1850s politics interferes with their uh, courtship. And I'm not going to read all of this, but it gives you a little bit of a sense. I, I thought it would be easier if you could see some of this as well. Nellie's fiance, William Gordon, was a Southern Democrat. So she's coming out of a Republican household in Chicago. And the women in this family are not shy about politics. They talk politics. They get involved in politics. And Nellie and Juliet are both uh, very, very um, uh, outspoken about their, their beliefs. William Gordon is a Southern Democrat, a slaveholder. Um, so he is living in Savannah as a slaveholder who affirmed, and he used this language. And I was able to find his correspondence back and forth with Nellie and William who affirmed slavery in its glory. Willie wrote that he deplored the Kansas and Nebraska Act for the agitation it roused. And of course, we know that that's what Abraham Lincoln and people like John Kinsey, it was the motivator for them to organize this new party. And on the other side of this, Willie Gordon is talking about how much he deplored it because he found the principle on which it stood just and those who opposed it guilty of treason. So again, this idea that the people who opposed the Kansas and Nebraska Act were treasonous. So that included Nellie's father, which didn't sit well with Nellie. Nellie rejected the notion that her family's views were treasonous. William suggested, again, that if Nellie was going to move to Savannah, she was going to have to what? She was going to have to match her opinions to the community in which she was to live, rather than the other way around. And their wedding plans just kind of were pushed off to the side as they're negotiating this over really three years. It takes them to reach an accommodation. And one of the big accommodations that they make is that Nellie, <laughs> uh, Juliet's daughter, um, convinces Willie that he's going to become Episcopalian. Um, so he joins the Episcopalian church and uh, she moves to to Savannah. And that's kind of the deal that I think they wind up cutting as they go along. At any rate, this young couple, you know, in many ways embodied the sectional crisis that um, was was just growing and growing in um, in uh, a, over the course of the late 1850s. So they get married in December 1857 at that church across the street from Juliet and John's house. They can look out the window at that church. That church is going to be the, the Episcopals are moving to a big cathedral up the road on Wabash in the, in the weeks following. So this is one of the very last things that take place in that original church. When Willie comes to Chicago for his 1857 wedding, none of his relatives come. His mother, who's very close to him, who travels often to New York, will not come to Chicago. And um, a Gordon family member explained, quote, it is against our principles to spend our money and countenance by our presence, uh, it, by our presence in a city so given it unto fanaticism. And it's really interesting because it's not something that I am immediately think of when I think of Chicago during these years because it's, oh, we are also the home of Stephen A. Douglas in the late 1850s. And one would think that Democrat and Republican would find Certainly, they both find a great deal of support within the city, but Willie is adamant about the fact that they're not going to, um, uh, they're, that, his, that, his, well, that his family members are coming. So he comes alone. And he says, you think it might be absurd? It is, at any rate, an honest absurd absurdity and a conscientious one. So they get married at this church, and they move to Savannah. So this is, the reason this house gets preserved in Savannah is because Juliet's granddaughter, Nellie's daughter, is the founder of the Girl Scouts in the United States. So it's Juliet Gordon Lowe is the namesake of Juliet Kinsey, 
and uh, then her maiden name is Gordon, so Juliet Gordon Lowe, and then she marries a British a guy and has a rough time, but comes back and marry and uh, founds the Girl Scouts. So it's it's a wonderful set of circumstances that a lot of the Kinsey family stuff winds up in Savannah. So those paintings on display, and Nellie's portrait is there in in Savannah. So it, again, great fun to be able to go do that. Okay, so Nellie has a very tough time when she goes down there um, at first. And um, Juliet is just reminding him that in the end, you know, Nellie has to understand you belong to him, to, to Willie, now that you're married. Uh, you must remember that as an individual, you have ceased to exist. And that's one of the things that I have wrestled with in this book, is thinking about how Juliet and Nellie's attitudes towards slavery are shaped to some degree by this. And I think she chose that word very, it's a very it's, it's, an, it's a word that, that sticks out with me. So this is the, uh, you belong to him. You remember that as an individual, uh, the word was bound, and it's up here. But that you, you have ceased as an individual to exist. So this idea of coverture is a very real thing to Juliet, and she often will make allusions to the kind of, the ways in which she has a very happy marriage, but that she's bound in that. So... In any event, Nellie begins to have children, and she has uh, two daughters before the Civil War is going to break out, and a third one in the very first years of the war. Just another image to get a sense of Chicago during these years. So Juliet has, uh, has made the trip, she, makes, she and her husband make the trip once to Savannah after her daughter's marriage in 1857 before, uh, and the, they never come up. Uh, the, Juliet's uh, daughter is, uh, her husband really doesn't want them anywhere near Chicago. But Juliet starts to write to Nellie about what's going on in Chicago. So we get a lot of letters about May 1860 when the Abraham Lincoln is nominated at the Wigwam. And uh, Juliet is uh, on the platform the first day. She's one of the committee, right, that decorate the inside of the Wigwam. She sat at the opening festival upon the platform near the speakers. And, you know, once the convention starts, women aren't allowed on the floor or on the, on the, the stage. There's one exception. That's uh, Mary Livermore, who's up on stage as a reporter. But other than that, it's all, uh, so this is her chance to be on that floor. And she knows it's that her chance. We had a right good time, and everybody who stopped to speak said it was a pity that you weren't there. And this is when you start to think about, these are letters that got read aloud down in Savannah. And she's writing these letters, Juliet is writing these letters to kind of needle, I think, her, her son-in-law as well as her daughter's in-laws. Um, she's living in a house that her mother-in-law, that Nellie is living in the house that, in fact, her mother is the, the mistress of um, through, uh, through a whole, the whole of the Civil War. Um, at the bottom, um, you get... She's, uh, Juliet quotes um, from someone that she was talking to that it takes, a Chicago, takes Chicago to do up a thing splendidly. Oh, how I wish you were here. And just more images of the, and Abraham Lincoln being nominated. May 21st, 1860, so a week after she'd been up on the stage, she's writing to her daughter about the nomination of Lincoln, that she stood for three hours out on a corner to watch the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, acceptance and the, the, by the crowds of people that were happy to have Lincoln there. Of course, Lincoln wasn't there, but he comes up to Chicago in December of 1861, and he makes the rounds. And he makes the rounds to the houses on the near north side, in particular on the near west side, the homes of prominent Republicans. And he doesn't come to the Kinsey house. It's a pretty small house by this point in time. But the Kinseys are invited to the, these, uh, these receptions in honor of Abraham and Mary Lincoln. And at one of them, Juliet corners, and I think corners is probably the appropriate word, uh, Abraham Lincoln, and starts talking to him. And at one point, she recounts to her daughter that she told Abraham Lincoln that she, me, the grandmother of thousands. So she's identifying herself as the grandmother of Chicago.
He's one of these early founding families in a city that's grown a lot, but she's then describing Abraham Lincoln as the father of millions. So this, this, uh, this story is one that she tells over and over again about, about the two of them. The war itself, so Julia Kinsey writing to her daughter in July of 1861, if there is anything bad in the hearts of men and alas, that I should have to say, women also, whether at the North or the South, the present differences will open the floodgates of expression. As it is a sort of family quarrel, and I think you all in this room know that that's a description that you see fairly regularly of the Civil War as a family quarrel. And this family really felt that it was, it saw it as a family quarrel. It was a family quarrel. April 12th, when they get the news, when Juliet gets the news that the war has broken out, she's writing, just writes pages and pages and pages off to her daughter, confirming the news. And then what does she get worried about? Yesterday, there was no mail by which I could write to you. She's writing her daughter two or three times a week. Her daughter is writing her back that same time. Their lives are very much spent in writing these letters back and forth to each other. And she says, my children, my children, no, she's talking about her, her daughter and her grandchildren, am I indeed to be cut off from them, not to see or even hear from them for years? I trust some means may be found for us to communicate at least occasionally. And she says, little did I think when I yielded a reluctant consent to give up my daughter to a distant home that the time would ever come that home would become a foreign and hostile one. And again, that's, that's one of those phrases that... Um, when I think about this, and again, that this, the women, the role of women, she's encouraging her daughter not to um, rouse any aggravating fe f feelings amongst folks. By April 29th, she's really she's she's comforted that she knows that some of her letters are getting through to her daughter. And then there's just going to be an ongoing trope: is whose fault is it when letters don't get through? Is it the fault of the president of Abraham Lincoln, or is it the fault of, um, the, in the Confederacy, the, the Southern um, unwillingness to deliver any of this mail? And this is, again, um, so I did not blame the president, but Baltimore that was obstructing troops, right? Um, and then, again, um, oh, how I wish you had come north before the troubles began. Everyone says so. She would be better here if her husband is away. So. Nellie's husband will join the Georgia Hussars in the early days of the, 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 the Confederacy. So even before um, Abraham Lincoln's inauguration, he's a part of that. Um, the mail is just a huge deal to her. I, I, if I'm thinking about what does the Civil War uh, mean for Juliet on a day-to-day -day basis, it's this intense reliance on the mail. Um, and so when President Lincoln in his first inaugural says, we're going to make sure the mail gets delivered north and south, right? And he does say that, and it's, I think he's, I mean, he does it with the eye towards the country is not torn asunder. I'm going to, we'll, we'll see that the post office delivers mail north and south. And he's unable to follow through on that. That just does not, there's going to be all kinds of, of, um, discontinuities in mail delivery. But um, again, there was really not enough, there really was no provision for moving mail from north to south. So what does Juliet do? She turns to a very deep kin network and she starts to turn to everyone she knows that might have a connection that could informally move things across. So she's got uh, family in Kentucky and she's sending things to family in Kentucky and there then figuring out how to get it to uh, get letters on to into Georgia. Uh, uh, her husband regularly traveled to Cairo in southern Illinois as a part he's going to become a U.S. Army paymaster. And um, in, in Cairo, Juliet found a friend willing to forward mail into the Confederacy. And then she's, her, her son, her oldest son, is, um, get, works with steam engines and he works for a couple of railroad lines in the first 18 months of the war. And he's, she's sending letters with him, and he's sending them on with anyone he knows that can send them on to, to, their, to, their, uh, to their daughter. The oldest, uh, excuse me, the second son will join the army first. 
and he uses letters of truce to send, uh, excuse me, flags of truce to send letters through. Let's see. What I got. Yeah, there we go. Um, Juliet also used contacts outside the United States. So one of her, one of the easiest ways for her to send letters <laughs> was to mail them to London, to her friends in London. <laughs> and friends in London would then mail them back to the Confederacy. Uh, she had family in Havana, and she would send letters to Havana. And from Havana, the letters would then get sent to her daughter, Nellie, in Savannah. So that was, that was two of the routes that they used. Uh, her brother, Bermuda, Canada, she sent stuff to Canada a lot, too. Uh, when Juliet's brother, Julian, and his wife traveled to Europe, like lots of Chicagoans during the war, they became another contact for Nellie and Juliet. So they, they both write to these folks in, uh, in London who would then uh, turn that. At one point, John, John Kinsey, noting all the scheming about routes that his wife had made, suggested tonning cheek, I expect she will try the China route next. So again, the idea that he's watching his wife pretty much every day, trying to think of a new way to get letters to her, uh, her daughter. Um, Julia does work with the sanitary fair. Um, it's something that she had been involved very much in institutions across the 1840s and 1850s in Chicago, and she'll be a part of that. But, you know, a lot of her time and energy was spent on these letters, and then also now getting boxes of, of, uh, of supplies to her daughter as well. She's also going to send letters off to her sons. The first son that... Uh, that enlists is Arthur. Uh, he's a 20-year-old student at Kenyon College in Ohio, so the Episcopal College in Ohio. He is uh, just about to graduate, uh, but a whole, he joins a light, light, oh, you guys, I'm gonna screw this up. Um, light artillery, is that right? Did I say it right? A uh, group that, that the, the company that he joins comes right out of St. James Episcopal Church. So it's everybody from the church joins this company and goes down to Cairo in the very first days of the war. So this 20-year-old goes off in this first group. And of course, what Julia does a couple days later is she gets in the train with Sunday dinner <laughs> and they bring it down to this company of soldiers. So they're, um, they're back and forth while they're in Cairo fairly regularly. Arthur will soon join his uncle, David Hunter. Um, and you've got this, his, his, uh, his uncle, David Hunter's uh, uh, staff. Uh, John Kinsey goes to Washington, D.C. in after the war starts I think in late May 1861, he is 60 years old, and uh, he volunteers, and he goes to visit Abraham Lincoln because he knows Abraham Lincoln. The people from Chicago that just are rolling through Washington, William Ogden, um, Mark Skinner, they're just rolling through, and, and David Hunter are advising uh, well, Lincoln and Lincoln's trying to place them in, 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 in jobs and does place a lot of them in jobs. And John Kinsey then is appointed the paymaster who's going, uh, one of the paymasters for the army that's operating out of Detroit and Chicago. So he's actually going to be home for a good part of the war, but also then in Detroit. His brother will be a paymaster. Uh, he's in a lot of different places, Kansas, and then uh, further at hand. Uh, Uncle Robert starts out, this is, this is her brother-in-law, another brother-in-law, is at Alexandria. And um, again, she's writing to her daughter in Savannah about all of this stuff that's going on back in, um, in Chicago and then across the north. David Hunter's an interesting, again, is Juliet's brother-in-law. He goes east with uh, Abraham Lincoln, travels with him uh, as he makes his way east with that trip where he's stopping and giving speeches all the way along the way. And then he's, he basically is camping out in the White House, in the east room of the White House, in the first weeks after the, the, uh, the inauguration. And uh, Hunter that will be promoted to a major general by August of 1861. And he is, uh, he's going to wind up 
uh, in the southern district, and we'll come back to his story because he's going to be he's going to be st he's going to wind up outside of Savannah directing troops. Juliet's oldest son John does not enlist in the army um, initially, so his father and the middle son have gone off. John does not. John's making quite a bit of money working. He's a he's an engineer. I mean, not trained as an engineer, but he he knows steam engines, and he's working with steam engines. He worked on. Um, Steam, um, steam boats. Uh, the Lady Elgin was one of the ones that certainly is, is a story that, that uh, percolates up over and over again because they know the dangers of him working near steam engines, but he's on working for a number of railroads. And he gets married in 1861 with a young daughter before he joins the army. So he's a much later arrival in the, into the story. But he, get, he goes with the, with the Navy, so he gets involved with the steamboats and the ironclads uh, on the Mississippi. And he's helping to build, and then he's helping to operate uh, the uh, steamboats on the Mississippi. And uh, by April of 1862, Juliet is writing to her daughter, Nellie, your brother John is now probably near Memphis. He thinks his boat, the Mound City, the greatest invention in the world. By God's mercy, their victory has been bloodless one. So again, this is at uh, island number 10, right? Um, the, the success is on a in April of 1862. But he's on the Mound City, and the Mound City is hit by Confederate, uh, a Confederate um, shelling in uh, June of 1862, and her oldest son dies in that attack. He's just, he's, he's right next to the steam engine and it takes about a week for him to die but he's uh, he dies down uh, near Memphis um, and they're just she's describing his burial um, back up here at St. James um, and if you go into actually it's an interesting thing one of the remnants of the Civil War in Chicago if, if you haven't seen it maybe you have you probably know this you're the Civil War Roundtable I didn't realize it was here this is in the um, the foyer of the, that's not the, what it's called, of the St. Episcopal, of the St. James Episcopal Church. This was a uh, monument to all of the soldiers, all of the Episcopal soldiers from Chicago that died in the Civil War. And um, it survives the fire, the Chicago fire. So the building burns down, but this monument and some of the walls remain so that this is, um, so the narthex are still uh, is still standing, and John Kinsey's name is on that list with many of his neighbors because they were all um, there were so many of the. Then right. all right, so Nellie wanted details of death. She'll write, and uh, she had asked her husband. She wanted to go off and um, and uh, come back to Chicago, and her husband refused to to allow her to try and make that happen. Um, Julie, and I just, it might be worth if I could just to read a little bit of what's going on with Nellie down in Savannah during these, um, during this time. Nellie, uh, Nellie's husband is gone. He's, he's not home very much. He's up in Virginia for a good part of the war. Um, and um, he, um, oh, I had the page number and I wanted to share this with you. Yeah, here we go. So um, Nellie tried to remain loyal to her husband, but also to her her, her birth family. Um, Nellie wrestled with her divided sympathies. In contrast, her cousin Posey, so Juliet has a cousin Posey who's married to another Confederate officer um, who had actually been in the US Army and resigns his commission to join the Confederacy. But Posey, her cousin, often stayed with David Hunter. So she crossed back and forth between enemy lines, this cousin. 
that also spent time with Nellie in Savannah. She spent six to eight months, particularly 1862 into 1863, after her brother has died, after Nellie's brother has died. David Hunter, her un their uncle, is um, the commander outside of Savannah for U U.S. forces in May of 1862. And um, uh, let's see uh, what they what they what they got. And Posey was the only member of the Kinsey family welcome in the Gordon household, and she spent over six months with Nellie and Savannah. Juliet was grateful that the cousins were together, but the Gordons couldn't help themselves from expressing their displeasure with Posey's defiant support of the Union. Nor could their neighbors. One night, when the cousins returned to the Gordon home, they found the contents of a privy had been thrown over the steps and the front door of that big house in Savannah. So you get some sense of. They were not that they were not seen as the best of uh, neighbors, and that goes back and forth. This tense situation that they found themselves, that Nellie finds herself in Savannah, was exacerbated in April 1862 when Union forces camped 18 miles east of Savannah. General Hunter, again her uncle, accompanied by Nellie's brother, Juliet's son, Arthur, headed the Union campaign to retake the region. Nellie and her cousin found themselves targeted specifically because we were the nieces of General Hunter. And in fact, the commander at Savannah at one time jokingly suggested that they put, that they put uh, Nellie and Posey, that they tie, her, tie them both up to the top of the highest uh, church steeple in uh, Savannah as a way of keeping their uncle from attacking the, the, uh, the, the city itself. Nellie and her cousin found themselves targeted. Their distress was even more acute when Hunter proclaimed an end to slavery. You remember in late April, beginning of May, David Hunter begins to enroll uh, black soldiers from the area. Arthur is going to do some of this early training without the permission of President Lincoln, who's, who's going to put down the Confederates, this, uh, who's going to put this down. Um, and this is Hunter writing to Abraham Lincoln about what's going on um, and telling Hunter in no uncertain terms that he is to cease and desist enrolling black soldiers. This is, again, before um, he's willing to have that done. That was 1862, sorry. Um, Arthur wants to see his sister while he's stationed outside of Savannah with, with the U.S. forces. And Arthur knew his uncle would smooth away for the visit. Nellie will not let her brother come to visit. She did not understand how her family could be so blind. Should we check and see what that is, or are we OK? Uh, yeah. uh, Maybe it was, it was on the Zoom broadcast. Could you mute, mute your computer? Please. Thank you. Uh, so it's question time. Thank you. <laughs> Nicely done. Thank you. Sergeant at arms here. Truly. Oh, I do this. Truly, 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 truly. It's yeah, it had it the voice of authority. It's what works. Um, okay, so back to Julia. Julia decide Julia is sending all these letters different ways. She's also trying to get trunks and packages sent to her daughter. And one of the big things that she's, uh, she does is she writes to Abraham Lincoln. She writes him a personal letter, um, relying on their personal relationship, describing her daughter as a poor little prisoner of war who was a citizen of Chicago who loves her home and her, her old flag. She closes the letter that she writes to Abraham Lincoln, very truly and respectfully, your friend Juliet A. Kinsey. And Lincoln says, OK, you can send trunks. Um, OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we're OK. So just a couple of things. The, the Juliet story, the family story gets a little. So we've got one son who's died. The youngest son was at the University of Chicago. He was a very, he was uh, not 18, so he was 16 when the war starts. And at by the time, in 1864, he wants to enlist. He wants to be a part of the war. He says, what am I going to tell my grandchildren if I don't get to serve in this war? And Juliet's like, I don't care what you're going to tell your grandchildren. Um, I mean, she really did, in no uncertain terms. 
nevertheless, he's going to get to, he does join. But what they get, what he joins is not the regular U.S. Army, but they let him join as a military guard. And he's sent off to Memphis. And his brother, Arthur, visits him, who's also still serving. Um, again, his brother is serving by this point as an aide to General C.C. Washburn. And again, this is a a familiar story probably to many of you when Confederate General Nathan Bedford Forrest raided Union headquarters at Memphis um, and captured not Forrest, but they did amongst the people they did capture were both Kinsey brothers. So this is in 1864, both brothers, just because, our, uh, because the, the one brother, the younger brother, George, was visiting his older, his older brother, they both wind up being captured. They're taken to Catawba prison in uh, Alabama. And while they're in Alabama, there begins yet another uh, sense of how the, the family ties are crossed and intersected. Nellie writes to her husband to try and work through the Confederate lines to get his, her brothers released. Nellie gets <laughs> on a train and she makes her way. She wants to see Jefferson Davis. So she's decided if she can get to Jefferson Davis, she will, get, she will have her brothers released. Juliet's working the other way, but she's also going to write to Jefferson Davis because despite the fact that they made family jokes about the furniture, the large furniture from up in Portage, her, she felt she could again rely on writing directly to Jefferson Davis as she wrote to Abraham Lincoln. And the two boys are released. Uh, Nellie doesn't make it all the way. She's trying to get to the prison and, and, uh, and figure out what to, if she, actually, she's working towards the prison first, uh, the, prison, the prisoner camp. Uh, but they get, again, they are, uh, they, uh, they, uh, they are released from this prison uh, by the fall of 1864. And just one more piece here in terms of what goes on, because the, the ways their stories intersect. When Juliet, when Nellie, wait, excuse me, Nellie is still in Savannah. She's got three children. Juliet is still writing letters. When she sees that General Sherman, who's got a lot of Illinois troops with him, <laughs> is moving on, on, on Atlanta. And then when he starts to move across to Savannah, she starts this furious letter writing campaign to everyone she can think of who's in the units with Sherman going across Georgia. Why? Because she wants them all, everyone she can think of, to know that she has a daughter in Savannah that needs to be taken care of, that they need to take care with. And um, she, again, Colt is this, Edward Colt is uh, an aide to, um, to Sherman that, um, that's an important part of this. So just before December, just before Christmas in 1864, General Sherman gets to Atlanta. Union forces march to arch along the Savannah Street just outside that Gordon residence. Juliet's granddaughters, who by now are walking around and talking, peeked out through the shutters tightly closed to the Yankees. They wondered out loud, which was old Sherman? A few days later, General Sherman came to Nellie's house in part on the insistence of one of his aides who says, this is a Chicago girl and you need to come visit her and see if she needs anything. And um, Jill, Nellie received the Union commander courteously, which does not make her a friend of anyone. Her family, the, her in-laws are incredibly angry with this. When her husband finds out that she has entertained Sherman in their house, he quits talking to her for months, uh, and it looks like they're just going to completely split up, but Nellie figures out how to thread that needle in the spring, and they get back together again. But um, the, um, again, Nellie says she was truly glad of the visit and the home letters that he brought, and in person, so he had letters. So what does he arrange? He arranges for Nellie and her daughters to leave Savannah and go to Chicago. They're going to go through New York. So he arranges for them to get to New York that they will have. So they, get, they, get, they, they, leave, they leave Savannah at this point in time. And uh, the other thing that leaves and, uh, is are bales of cotton. So Nellie has been holding bales of cotton in the house. And Sherman agrees to have them shipped to New York 
um, under U.S. flag, and um, they're going to be sitting in a New York in a warehouse in New York for months. And one of the big one of the last things that uh, John, her father John Kinsey, does is to write letters off to Abraham Lincoln asking him to release these these uh, bales of cotton. And he does do that. Uh, he doesn't do that, but his her father does that. This is in the weeks just before Abraham Lincoln is assassinated, um, you know. And uh, this is this is this is Willie on Sherman being in their home. What really galls me is that you should associate with my enemies upon any terms than those politeness de de demands. Okay, that's the letter. But then Abraham Lincoln is assassinated, and we've got the funeral march, and John Kinsey, Juliet's husband, dies just weeks after that of a heart attack, after he's, getting reuni after he's been reunited with his granddaughters and his daughter, um, who comes back, and I'll close up here, who's at the very end, who's at the end of the war, who's still there, who comes to Chicago, is, is Willie Gordon. So Willie Gordon's the Confederate uh, officer married to uh, Nellie uh, Kinsey Gordon. And when her father dies in June of 1857, William Gordon travels to Chicago. So I think it's an interesting place for us to stop because Willie, for years and years and years, talks about how the Northerners in Chicago cannot be, you cannot visit with them. You cannot be there. You cannot uh, interact with the people there. And they were, and that Nellie needed to, to be a Savannah, a resident of Savannah, a Southerner. But they get here in June of 1857, 1865, excuse me. Uh, the couple receive a loan of $7,000 from a Chicago banker. And the loan agreement uh, Nellie keeps, and it's in her papers, in the Gordon family papers that are saved for many years. So to get this loan, William Gordon did something that is really, I, I just, it's kind of incredible that he did it. He presented himself in July of 1857 as from Chicago, Illinois. You know, this is someone who wouldn't, who wouldn't come to Chicago, wouldn't let his, his uh, family come to Chicago, but he presents himself in this way so he'd get the $7,000 loan. It does recoup the, the he comes, goes back to Savannah and he's able to start his brokerage business up again, his cotton brokerage up, business up again. And the Gordon family recoups and then some their fortune in the, 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 the decade after the war. And it really is on the basis of this loan that's made to him there. Okay, I'm going to stop there. I'm happy to take questions uh, about what's going on with this family, if anyone, or comments about what's going on. Yes. How long did it take for those letters to get to Europe and then get back to Savannah? Yeah, it was it was letter. often taking five or six weeks would be a short time. It could take much longer. Imagine yeah. months. Yeah, a lot of times it did, but the thing is, they, they started numbering their letters so that they often were getting them out of order so that they could start to figure out whether they were getting something that was three weeks late, you know, so that they had a better sense of, of the order on them. Um, so they're increasingly numbered. But they're amazing. And Nellie is incredible that she kept them. I mean, her mother was an incredible writer uh, and just devoted herself to this. But no, I, the, the stories of how she gets things from Chicago to Savannah is mind-boggling to me. But understandable. She wants to stay connected to her daughter and those grandkids. Yeah. So is Kinsey Street? Yes. Uh, it's named for the Kinsey family. So Kinsey Street runs through the Kinsey edition. So that's the, that first, one of the first editions Walcott's edition and Kinsey's edition, just north, or just, yeah, just on the north side of the main stem of the Chicago River. South of, just south of it is the, the original, the Canal Platte, right, the 1830 Thompson Platte. But no, you're exactly right, that's the Kinsey family. We were out, I was out with a group of students on Wednesday, my first tour for, in, since the pandemic started, 
And um, we got to Kinsey Street. And I did have a student say, is that the, guy, the, the family that we've been reading about? And I'm like, oh, you bet. Good work. So what ever happened to Julia after yeah. the war? So after the war. So her husband dies in uh, June of 1865. So she's a widow. She is, has a really tough time as a widow because her husband, her family was deeply in debt. So she spends <laughs> four years in probate court. And part of that, and then she starts to sue all kinds of people in Chicago because She's making dower claims on land. So she and her husband bought and sold a lot of land in the first three or four years of Chicago. So she sues everyone from the Newberries to Walter Newberry to William Ogden. And um, she gets some money in these dower claims. And ultimately, in 18, early summer of 1870, William Ogden settles with her. They were all in the same congregation. I mean, this was just an awful thing. Um, but she, she uh, as, as kind of a reward, she meets her daughter in New York. They go to Long Island, very close to where she was born, um, just across Long Island Sound. She dies of a, a morphine overdose. It was an accidental morphine overdose. She was thought she was taking quinine pills, and it turned out it was, it was morphine. So, um, she died, yeah, in 1870. So she dies before her house burns down in, back in Chicago, which I guess is a blessing in that sense. Not, it, no, it's not. I mean, it's, yeah. Most of her memoir was Bob wasn't that reissued, but around the turn of the last century by R.R. Donnelly of the Lakeside Classic book. Yeah, it, um, it's, it's uh, R.R. Donnelly's involved in several editions. You're exactly right. And um, Actually, uh, Nellie works very hard with R. R. Donnelly with that printing that's done in the early 20th century. Um, and then there's a beautiful, the Lakeside Classic is a little bit later because Milo Quaif does the introduction for it. So it's just, that's an incredible book too. But the editions are, the Caxton Club does an edition. I mean, they're really, it's just, some of these editions are just, you're, are just amazing. Um, the original, I've seen, I. <laughs> I've, I've, you know, I've held some of the original, uh, some of the eighteen, some some of the eighteen fifty six copies that are floating around, but it's a book that if you just Google Waba, W A U B U N, there are PDFs of this available. I mean, it's Internet Archives. You can get a copy of it online now, so you don't need to leave your computer screen to get it. But it's quite a story. You didn't mention that Juliet and John were in Wisconsin. So wh where did they? Uh, what were they doing up there? Where did they make all their money from at this time? Yeah. Speculation? Yeah, so to, two parts of that. So um, John Kinsey in 1830, when they get married, is the sub-agent for Indian Affairs for the Ho-Chunk. So he's basically the Indian agent for the Ho-Chunk, okay. for, you know, for the Winnebago. So he's mid-Wisconsin, and they'd set up um, a, an, Indian agency, an Indian agency at Portage, so just north of Madison. And that's where they go to live. And so initially, they're out in Indian country. And Juliet loves this. I mean, she just, she really, really wanted to move into Indian country. This was something that she, I mean, it's a, her uncle was an Indian agent at Chicago. So she had long connections with Chicago. But um, they're not going to make money doing that, particularly. So when the treaty here in Chicago in 1833 that comes after the Black Hawk War, that's going to move I mean, forcibly move the Potawatomi and their allies and so many other Indian groups west of the Mississippi River. When that takes place, the Kinsey family can make a preemption claim on all of the land north of the main stem of the Chicago River around the house that they had purchased. That they had purchased. They couldn't own the land before 18. 30 when the Thompson plant comes in, but after that. So they make a lot of money. They are really, really wealthy by the standards of almost anywhere, 1835, 1836, in those initial years of speculation. And it's New Yorkers that come in and buy, and they're making a lot of money. But the panic of 1837 and the ensuing depression wipes them out completely. Um, they make really bad investments. John Kinsey is a really interesting character. He knows a lot of Indian languages. He's very much at ease in Indian country. 
And then they decide to move to Chicago and become real estate investors and entrepreneurs. And he never really gets, he's, he's going to be outpaced by William Ogden, by uh, the Newberries, by the Rumseys, by families that are going to come in and become some of the wealthiest families in the country. Uh, Cyrus McCormick, right, in the, those years in the 1850s. McC uh, Kinsey will, will not do badly. I mean, I'm, we're not going to hold a tag sale for him because he remains a politician. <laughs> and he gets Whig posts by, because of Whig politicians. So he gets appointments in 1840 by the Harrison administration. And he's continued to hold posts that include the canal collector. So for the INM Canal, he's the canal collector for, at Chicago. So he's He's got, he, he handles uh, these kinds of posts. He does all, yeah, so that's what he does. So they, they make and then lose quite a bit of money. They don't lose the house. So that's one of the things that, and Julia, it's just not something, it's kind of, I think it must just be a deal breaker. She's unwilling to lose the house. So they do all kinds of things and go into debt, which is why she has so much trouble at the end of her life. Now, did she ever go back to? Did she ever go to Savannah after the Civil War? Did really have to see Nellie? Is that in any of the letters after the war? Did she she makes one out? trip. She goes on one but trip. she she's lost. She's only makes two trips there. That's the, but and but they were also on their way to Savannah when her husband dies. So they get they had they got to Pittsburgh, and he has a heart attack and dies, and they just come back. Um, another whole interesting thing is moving people, uh, dead bodies on the trains, and what that required. I mean, they had to have an American Express uh, agent accompany Juliet's body back from New York when she dies in New York and is going to be buried. They're buried at um, Graceland Cemetery. So they're actually some of the initial investors in Graceland, the Kinsey, John and Juliet Kinsey are. And uh, their gravesite is the Dexter Graves, the Dexter, the 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 really eerie, um, just gorgeous, oh, yeah. you got to look it up. The Dexter Grave, Graves Monument is just across from where the Kinsey, Kinsey plot is in Graceland. If you're cemetery, well, you are cemetery people. You go to, <laughs> yeah, this is, I'm talking to a room that gets this. So Graceland Cemetery, these, they're all in Graceland Cemetery, so it's kind of fun to see. She had, or Nellie puts up monuments after, um, when they've made their money back. So not in 1870, there was no money, but by 1875, 76, the Gordons have recouped uh, and then some, and she puts up uh, monuments to both her, her mother and father, and there's book a book on, on Juliet's. Uh, so it's really quite a testament. And then she goes back and she's gonna, Nellie's gonna work very hard to keep that book in print uh, over many, many years. Anyway. Thank you. Thanks very much. All right, thank you.